This is the Listening Books Podcast. For every kind of reader, and especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and this is our holiday edition, which means I'm joined by colleagues Amy, a familiar voice on this podcast, and Leave, who's joining us for the first time. We take a look at some notable film adaptations of books and how they measure up to their source material. As is tradition, we finish up with a game. Amy, why don't you start us off? Sure. So um, I thought I would try and find some film adaptations that I thought didn't quite live up to their source material. Um, But then that was actually more difficult than I thought, because it turns out there aren't many films that I haven't liked where I've also read the book (laughs) as well. Um, But uh, I mean, basically, I think I just watch and read things I know that I'm going to like. Um, But actually there was one film that did jump out at me and that was the Hitchcock adaptation of Rebecca from 1940 so uh yeah this is gonna include a few spoilers by the way so if you haven't seen this uh really old film or read the even (laughs) older book (laughs) then (laughs) maybe skip this next bit (laughs) um but basically I uh I saw the film not long after I read the book for the first time and I loved the book and it was at a point where I hadn't really read that many classics because I thought they'd be too hard (laughs) but I read this one and I was like oh no this is really good I really enjoyed it and then um, I watched the film and I was really annoyed that they made quite a few changes to it I think basically to make it more palatable for Hollywood at the time so in the book Max de Winter um, he kills his first wife, Rebecca, in a rage. Mm -hmm. And she is, you know, she is a piece of work, (laughs) but he is a murderer nonetheless. (laughs) Um, And I think at the time, you you couldn't have, in a Hollywood movie, you couldn't really have like a male love interest who was also a murderer. Uh, So they change it. So he like kills her accidentally. Yeah. um, Which I think takes all the passion out of the crime of passion (laughs) and the whole kind of like controversy of the main character be like still choosing to be in love with a murderer just isn't there in the film because he's not a murderer. And it's like, oh, actually, he's just a nice man who accidentally killed his wife. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, that's kind of, it's just not the same. Um, I wanted him to be a murderer. Um, and then also at the end of the book, um, they uh, kill, actually, was it at the, yes, yeah, so at the end of the film, sorry, they uh, kill off Mrs. Danvers. All right. Uh, whereas in the book, she escapes from the burning house uh, and is still at large, um, which I think is sort of like, I guess maybe they wanted, because she's like the villain in the in the movie, they wanted her to have like a clear ending, um, I suppose. But I kind of quite like the fact that she's still, is kind of, you know, um, yeah, a presence at the end of the book. Uh, I watched the more recent adaptation as well, and I can't really remember much about it, which probably says everything. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, neither film adaptation, I feel, lived up to it. Yeah, Rebecca is one of those, um, is one of those books that I can remember, like, the time and place of when I was reading it, because it, it had such an impact on me. I mean, it was such an immersive read, um, and, and I was so taken up with it that I can, you know, and this was um, quite quite a number of years ago. I wouldn't like to think exactly how many years ago, <laughs> but I can still remember very vividly um, that experience of reading the book. And I agree with you that I haven't seen an adaptation that really matches it yet, that really gets it. Yeah, and there may be more, actually. I, I, yeah, because the only ones I've seen are the 1941 and then the very, very recent one. There's probably some in between. Mm. Um, but yeah, my uh, next... I kind of got two choices together in this one. It's a bit of a Tim Burton double bill <laughs> of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory <laughs> and Alice in Wonderland. So I've gone for two children's books here. And it's basically because I think they were kind of bad for the same reason. Uh, in both cases, I think he took two very, well, he took a, a magical children's story and really just sucked the life out of it. <laughs> and I think um, my main problem with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the uh, Tim Burton version was Johnny Depp as Willy Wonka. And I suppose here, maybe I'm slightly unfairly comparing him to Gene Wilder, who played him in the original film, rather than maybe comparing uh, him to what I think Willy Wonka is like in the book. But I did feel like the original movie and the performance really like conveyed the dark thread that Roald Dahl has through most of his children's books and the way that Willy Wonka is sort of a 
benevolent but also slightly unhinged and unpredictable and a bit of a weird presence mm. and I think they really get that in the first film and I tend to think Johnny Depp is just a wig and a silly voice <laughs> uh, in a lot of films <laughs> not just in that one also in Alice in Wonderland where he is the Mad Hatter as well oh yeah um, and in my no in my notes here I've just put um, for Alice in Wonderland um, the whole movie is just very dull <laughs> so I think uh, yeah I feel like both of those films are are more of an aesthetic than they are a real film uh, with depth or with anything new to bring other than the aesthetic that Tim Burton brings. Yes, it's got like the Tim Burton filter on it. Yeah. And it's very brightly colored. And um, I get, because I guess they're both quite old now. I can't remember which one came first. I feel like it was maybe Alice in Wonderland. And there was a lot of like the new CGI in it that looked quite bad. I seem to remember like the CGI versions of Tweedledee, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, who I think were sort of played by Matt Lucas, but like, it was sort of like a CGI character, but like with him voicing it or something. And uh, it just looked really, really bad. Mm. And it was just, that was quite distracting. And yeah, no, I, I don't think, like you say, not really bringing anything new to the table <laughs> with that. So yeah, I think I was quite disappointed when I saw those. Uh, so uh, my third choice is, uh, and basically just because I loved talking about how bad this film <laughs> is, uh, is, the, is the 2019 cats movie <laughs> <laughs> and I, I i suppose i'm mainly comparing it to the stage musical but i don't think that film did anything to really advertise the world that t.s Eliot created uh which is a shame uh and i, I really love the musical um the stage musical uh i used to be really obsessed with like the 90s film of it which was just a film it was just like a recording of the stage performance but that was I, I just don't know how adaptable it is as a as like a proper film and I think it was I mean and there's been so much out, written out there about how totally awful it was so I mean I'm not going to say anything new here but there were just so many problems with it and it was just again it was like sucking the life out of something which is quite magical and I realize that Cats is absolutely not for everyone <laughs> and even people that like musicals absolutely hate Cats um but yeah, I have always really loved it. And I think I, I really like how the uh, poems are all quite uh, weird. And uh, I kind of feel like the stage musical kind of really, uh, a, a, it was very good at kind of like um, really taking the eccentricity of it. And then the movie was just a weird, but in a totally different way. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I kind of felt like it was, it was funny. And I went to see it in a cinema and everyone was laughing. Uh, but not for the right reasons. <laughs> and I kind of thought, oh, this is such a shame. Because it's such like an emotional piece of media. And it just kind of became this like big joke because no one could take the characters seriously. And then like when like, you know, people have trained for years to be able to like get like get onto the West End or, onto, like, or Broadway to, like, to play those characters. And, you know, like the vocal range, the dance, the skill, all of it. I felt it was just very much undermined by a bunch of celebrities just kind of being plonked into those roles and being like, right, well, you know, be a weird, like, CGI cat now. Yeah, and I think um, that's it. It was a CGI as well. And I think uh, a lot of the, the um, uh, I think the spectacle of, like, all the costumes and the makeup is something to really enjoy about it and the stage musical. And obviously that just wasn't there in the film because it's uh, because it's CGI. And again, yeah, I'm I, aware I'm just really like I'm comparing it to the stage musical really rather than the poems. But I do think it's a shame because that movie will be like a lot of people's first introduction to like that world. And they'll just be like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> and then and then that'll probably be the end of, of the journey for them. Yeah, I suppose that's a big risk with um, film adaptations, isn't it? Because for better or worse, that is what tends to be lodged in cultural memory more so than whatever it was adapted from. Mm. Yeah, uh, I yeah. think so. And I wonder what, uh, I guess, yeah, T.S. Eliot would have thought of the stage musical in general, but then uh, the film, <laughs> probably yeah. not too happy. Apparently, actually, go back to Roald Dahl with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Apparently, he hated every adaptation of his books. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how true that is, but that's something that I've heard. Uh, I don't know why exactly, but um, I guess, like, yeah, he's probably wasn't alive for the most recent Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one. Uh, no, he wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, probably for the best. <laughs> 
I, I was trying to think of some adaptations that I like more than the book, which there's probably uh, not that many. Most of them I just kind of think are like, you know, on par or they've done a good job or whatever. But uh, I actually watched the most recent Little Women uh, the one that came out a couple of years ago and uh, probably quite a controversial opinion. But uh, I try- I'd not read the book uh, when I saw the film. I tried to read it afterwards and I absolutely loved the film. Couldn't finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it was because it was not a book that I grew up with. I guess lots of people really love it because they read it when they were younger. Um, and yes, it wasn't really part of my life when I was a child. Um, and in the movie, they kind of intertwine the two books uh, and make it into one narrative so when they're older and when they're younger and I didn't realize at first that they'd done that um I didn't realize that like the first book is just about when they're kids and I uh tried to read it and I, I it wasn't really for me which I thought was odd seeing as like I really loved the film yeah I think though what you're just saying there just goes to show like the choices that Greta Gerwig the the director of this adaptation made that so that improved the experience of the story. And that must have been a bit challenging to weave those different time periods together in the way that she did. But I, I agree with you, Amy. I think that it was to the improvement over the, of the overall narrative structure. Yeah, yeah. I thought, yeah, she did it really, really well, I think. And yeah, it definitely kind of like breathed a bit more life into it to kind of go back and forth the two timelines. So yeah, I thought I thought that was really, really good. So, Jess, uh, what adaptations have you chosen? Um, well, I think I may have gone more for a successful adaptation slant than you did, Amy. Mm-hmm. But I'll start with the one that I have real complaints about. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of people share these complaints with me. And that is for um, Peter Jackson's adaptation of The Hobbit, which in book form, at its heart is just a simple tale and and meant for children and it is not an epic. <laughs> it doesn't need three films to be made <laughs> out of this one simple tale. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, and now I'm someone who would have waited outside in the queue for the cinema with, this is the thing that my brother and I did together every time one of the new Lord of the Rings films came out because I was in college at the time in university. And and this was this was our thing that we would do together. Um, every time one of these films came out, we were so excited about it. And I kept up with all of the casting decisions and, you know, what choices he was making for different scenes and whatever. And I was just so excited. Oh. So, like, <laughs> I had high expectations for The Hobbit and definitely was skeptical when I heard that three films were uh, going to be wrung out of the material. Um, and <laughs> honestly, I'm not entirely sure I even watched all three now because I was so bored with the first one. I, I just think... I think he got it wrong and and I kind of understand why he did because generally you read The Hobbit before you read The Lord of the Rings and so what you get is the charm of innocence and the innocence is the ignorance of the deeper underlying story. So the great thing about The Lord of the Rings, which you would typically read after The Hobbit is that what seemed superficially to be a simple tale that began with an ordinary hobbit deciding to go on an adventure, which was very uncharacteristic for a hobbit, <laughs> um, and that and which ended when he came home again, is actually just one small part of a much bigger story with much higher stakes. And and that's part of the joy of both of them. That's that's part of the joy of getting to the Lord of the Rings, um, is realizing this much bigger tale and it's part of the joy of the hobbit just skating on top of a much deeper story but not actually going into detail so when peter jackson makes the lord of the rings films first and then goes back and makes the prequel he kind of doesn't approach it with that innocence of ignorance he approaches it with all that information and so he's you know he sort of packs all of this stuff in from the appendices. And, you know, there's a reason that stuff was in mm. the appendices. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, The Hobbit, 
as an adaptation, even though I really appreciate the love that Peter Jackson has for those books, his adaptations of The Hobbit really didn't do it for me. On the other hand, um, a book that I think was adapted really well, and probably because the author also wrote the screenplay, um, is Room by Emma Donoghue. Um, And I think that that innocence that comes from ignorance um, also plays a part here, both in why it's so successful an adaptation, but also why I still think the book is a better experience overall. Um, Room is told, the, the novel is told from a child's perspective, and this child is being held captive in uh, this room. And this is the only world that this child knows, has, has never been outside of the room. And so by having him narrate the story, you don't catch on immediately necessarily to to what's going on and what the true circumstances are. And so it's a little bit disorientating. And and so as the revelations come to you, as you realize what's happening, um, it's it's a really effective way to tell the story. And of course, with film, you can't see a story being told from a child's innocence because you're seeing it with your adult eyes. The, you know, the camera has to show you <laughs> literally what, mm. what is there. Um, but they made some really good choices to, for example, not show you anything outside that room until the child escapes. Uh, again, sorry, spoilers. Um, but you, you wouldn't want to read a book where he doesn't escape, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. The escape is pretty early on, I feel like as well. It's not like it's, you know, that's the ending. It's sort of like most of the book is about them coping after they come out. Yeah, that's true. It, so. It's not, yeah. yeah. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's a, really at the beginning, but yeah, there's still quite a bit of book after that because you're right. That's not like the end of the yeah. story. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I do think it's a great adaptation uh, written by the author and that, you know, Highly recommend authors go ahead and write the screenplay <laughs> while you're at it. Yeah, it's always better, isn't it? Yeah. Like they know which bits to I, I found with that adaptation actually with Room, like she took out exactly the right bits to make it shorter. And I felt there were some bits in the book that went on for a little bit and, and oh, really? they went there in the in the movie and stuff, or it was shorter in the movie. And yeah, so I think like sometimes they say that it's difficult for authors to adapt their own novels because they're too close to it but I think a lot of the time yeah it just feels like you're kind of watching you're getting that same experience from the book really um again yeah yeah I would imagine it would be um easier almost for an author to do it rather than harder just because I feel like when you're in the novel in your head right when you're writing I get the sense that you have such a cinematic like you almost have a film like happening in like in front of your eyes, like you have the vision and you have the movement and you have yeah, a sense of like what your characters look like and a sense of like like the scenes that they're in and all of these things. And so yeah, no, I just think that that's funny. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed that that's an experience authors have. Yeah, I think I, I read that she had actually written the screenplay before the book was published or oh, as wow. it was being published. I mean it was um like it hadn't I don't think the film rights had been bought or anything, but she had gone ahead and written it before it even became a success as a book. Um, so it was sort of ready to go, which... Mm. I think I um, I think I read her agent told her to do that because... Oh, really? I think it is quite rare that authors, when they sell the film rights to their books, I think it's quite rare they end up getting to be able to write the script themselves. I think it always just gets farmed out to script writers. Um, I think maybe it's easy. It's easier for producers to work that way. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think her author, said, her agent said, um, "This is probably going to get made into a film, and you need to write the script now, uh, so hmm. you have it ready to go." And they can't argue with it. <laughs> wow. So did, yeah, I wonder, did she do that with the wonder as well? Then possibly, yeah, yeah. Although mm. maybe because she's already written a screenplay this time, it might be easier for you to like kind of keep adapting your own books if you've got a good track record of doing it before. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't. Um, I've, I did actually read The Wonder, but I've not seen the film yet. I think it's just come out. Uh, but yeah, it'll be on Netflix soon, I think. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, I think that one might be a good one for the holidays, actually. And 
speaking of which, that my last two that I brought to talk about uh, would also be really good for over the holidays, during the festive period, um, when you're just looking for nice comfort watching. The Princess Bride by William Goldman. Now, this is one of those that I think the film adaptation has surpassed the book, maybe not in like objective quality, but in terms of cultural memory and where it lives in culture. I think people are very familiar with the film and maybe not as much with the book. I've never read the book before. Um, and I when I looked it up in our library, I realized that like the the version that listening books has is um is narrated by Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner, of course, directed the film The Princess Bride. Mm. So um I think that's a really cool you know thing to have to have him read that. Yeah, yeah. I think both the film and the audiobook seem like that would be really good for the winter holidays because they have that kind of comforting familiarity to them mm. and they're like crowd pleasers as well. So like everybody mm, in the house yeah. uh, would enjoy them. It's nice as well that that yeah, that the audiobook is connected to the film in that way because of course that is just an adaptation as well um yeah in a way and yeah to have the director reading it uh yeah to, and then connecting that back to the film in that way i think that's quite nice because yeah like you say the film has really overtaken the book like i think it's probably one of those those films that maybe people don't realize had been adapted from a book yeah um i think oh i actually uh found out recently talking of like holiday movies as well die hard that was a book um oh, was which it? i didn't know yeah it's not called no. die hard oh um, my gosh it's, it's, uh, it's gonna annoy me now i'm just gonna google the name of the novel nothing lasts forever is the name of the thriller book it's based on okay uh, yeah so there you go if Whoa, you want to read knew? the book that die hard is based on <laughs> it's called nothing lasts forever by, that would have been um, a really good quiz question. Yeah. For our game. So, oh. <laughs> uh, imagine mm. if that was one of your quiz questions and you were like, Amy, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> um, Roderick Thorpe. Uh, Roderick, Roderick Thorpe is the name of the author. Okay. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, last last one from me and then we'll move on to what Lee has brought for us. Um, great Expectations. Um, I've read the book, but um, I have read that the 1946, like all the way back to 1946, the 1946 adaptation by David Lean is still considered the definitive adaptation of this book, which has been adapted so very many times. And although I kind of recognize like still shots of that film, I don't know that I've ever actually watched it. So I think, now this is the one that stars um, Martita Hunt as Miss Havisham, John Mills as Pip, and Valerie Hobson as Estelle. Um, and I think that's one of these that, again, I would love to like put on while the fire's going and get a cozy blanket. I, it just feels, it just feels like a good film to watch during the uh, during the holidays, um, I have heard that the BBC has a new adaptation of it coming out soon, maybe December. So I might watch them both and compare and contrast. Um, but the BBC adaptation has Olivia Coleman playing Miss Havisham, so that alone should be something oh. to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, okay, National Treasure, yeah. National Treasure, Olivia <laughs> Coleman, absolutely. <laughs> 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 yeah it's already got like a couple of stars out of the five just by having her in it and then like yeah it can I'm sure it'll just make up the rest of five stars uh yeah um yeah that sounds good actually I don't think I've ever seen the 1946 version so maybe I'll do the same thing and I'll watch both and then I can compare Ooh. them <laughs> yeah we can have um, a little uh party <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, well that's all that I brought um leave which which adaptations would you like to talk about I'm going to talk about some really um, nostalgic franchises yeah? um, that I loved as a teen. Um, the first one of which is The Hunger Games, um, which we have available, um, narrated by Carolyn McCormick. So I read all of these like viciously as, a, as like a as like a young teenager. Um, they're kind of set in this like dystopian like world post 
a post like post dystopian world in North America in this like nation called Panem that's been split into like 12 districts in the capital. And the kind of premise of the book is that every single year, two children from each of the districts is sent to the capital to like a big arena um, and they have to fight to the death, which is a really dark premise for um, a book, particularly like a book that's aimed at, at kind of young adults. But yeah, like, so the books, I the books obviously were a phenomenon, but the way that the movies became a whole different, like a whole different cultural event, which even now, like me and my friends will like get together and watch this one and the next and the next franchise I'm going to talk about as well. Like we'll get together and we'll watch them and just like talk through them and it becomes like a whole experience. Um, for The Hunger Games, I think they were adapted really well. Um, the movies are really engaging. Um, it is funny though, because obviously they are so violent, like that, like, you know, like it's teenagers murdering each other. So there's this really weird movement between in your imagination, it doesn't, it never felt as violent. Um, whereas like suddenly when you're being confronted with it on a, on like a TV screen, you're like, oh wow, like this is really, really, really dark. Um, yeah. And one of the, like the big differences between the the books and the movies, but the books are kind of um, are framed in the first person, so you get everything from the perspective of the of the protagonist, Katniss Everdeen. You kind of get her whole view, and like you build the world that you're in through her through her perception of it. Whereas the movies are very much kind of you know set more third person, and everything is viewed much more well, yeah, objectively, and you kind of get like these scenes and shots that supplementarily build the world for you and I it's the one thing that I think a lot of people with this series were upset about like obviously it's very difficult to do a whole movie from the first person perspective but yeah I think you lose a lot of intimacy I think people really love the book because they loved Katniss and they loved having like a strong female protagonist who was flawed but who you know was strong and independent but you really like yeah you lose you lose intimacy with her and like understanding her. Um, and like, yeah, you just don't get the same kind of sense of her like internal world. So I think in ways, yeah, empathy comes into play in a different way because suddenly you're not like as as inside someone's someone's view. I think as well with the um with the movies, they really like launched Jennifer Lawrence, didn't they? And I think mm. It kind of sometimes when you have someone in a film that suddenly becomes so famous, it's sort of when you're watching the film, that's sometimes what you're thinking about, like in the back of your head, like, oh, it's Jennifer Lawrence. Like, do you know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard to see past the really, really famous person uh, if if they're playing a character from a book. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it's sometimes, yeah, difficult to connect with that character when you've got kind of this really like a big Hollywood star in the way. <laughs> I mean, she, I thought she was good in it, but... Um, yeah, I remember thinking that at the time because I'd read the books as well, all the first couple, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you what, with what you're saying about the internal world as well. Mm. What struck me is um, when you were talking, Leave, and, and talking about what how nostalgic they are for you. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's like a clear, the clear evidence of, of the difference in our ages, I think, because I was an adult, obviously, when, um, well, I say obviously, people are only listening to me. <laughs> You can't see. You can't see how old I am, but um, obviously, <laughs> you sound so young, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I wouldn't associate them with nostalgia yet because they still feel kind of recent to me relative to yeah. other things. Um, Whereas the nineteen forties, uh, great expectations. <laughs> <laughs> That's our nostalgia. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I just googling uh, when the Hunger Games uh, was published. I was like, "How old was I?" I maybe I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I want to say 2012. I'm going to guess because I remember I'd read Hunger Games and then Catching Fire, and I was waiting for Mocking Jay with like every fiber of my being. I was like, "Right, <laughs> please!" And I remember it coming in the post and like screaming through my house when it arrived. Oh, so, like, yeah. <laughs> What 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 what's Google? Uh, oh, the first book was published in two thousand and eight, so I was uh, yes, I was an adult. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, yeah. <laughs> no need to get specific <laughs> with an adult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean, speaking of nostalgia, the really big nostalgia for me was Twilight. I was like, you know, I said that I loved Hunger Games, but I was a proper, proper fangirl of, of Twilight. Um, <laughs> you know, I got my hair cut. Like to be like one of the characters, like yeah. everything. I was obsessed. Um, <laughs> that is commitment. <laughs> we also have these in audiobook. I would just want to add. Oh yeah, it was. Com- I was committed to the cause. Um, we also have these these ones narrated by Ileana Kadushin, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Yeah, I think this my big kind of upset with these. I think was very similar just to your upset with the Hobbit in that like, I think if I if I remember correctly, Twilight was more of a thing more of a kind of franchise before The Hunger Games was. And so I think it was kind of one of the big experiments in creating this big franchise and like having this huge fan base. I mean, similar to like a kind of parallel time to Harry Potter. And so like you really feel the sense that that they've become money-making operations, Um, you know, which is exemplified in the fact that like in The Hunger Games, the last book was made into two movies. And then also for Twilight, the last book was also made into two movies. And so, you know, like... You know, one could definitely argue that like, oh, right, this is because like there's so much plot, there's so much story to squeeze into this. But I just I just doubt it. I just think it's like, oh, what a great way to, you know, make a whole bunch more money. Um, Bro, regardless of my opinions about trying to squeeze money from films, um, I think Twilight felt really like of its era. And I think now a lot of people that watched it really, really earnestly now watch them as kind of like camp experiences like I mean there's something about like I said like getting together with some friends and being able to just mercilessly I don't know critique and comment on like the characters like what's happening like the absurdity of all of it um but yeah I mean it's just I think it's very sentimental now now that I'm through my um teenage fangirl phase and I'm now a fully fledged adult (laughs) Um, yeah, just on a whole deep dive, I think, into into series that I read and loved and was obsessed with. Um, so I kind of wanted to like flip that over and talk about a movie that I loved, um, but never read the book of. But I've always been fascinated in the book because of how much I've loved the movie. The movie's called Arrival. It's this kind of sci-fi film where, in essence, these like aliens come down to Earth and this professor's trying to figure out how these aliens are trying to communicate with her. And it's just, it's such a beautiful meditation on the human experience and language and communication. And there's this really interesting, I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into it because it's gen, it's so worth watching. There's this really interesting movement in how time weaves its way through the movie that I've always wondered how, um, so the book is, is called The Story of Your Life by T- Ted Chiang, which I also hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, I always wonder how Ted has managed to, yeah, in essence, build, build that narrative that is so heavily reliant on moving through time and being able to kind of be in the future while understanding the past and being in the present. Um, yeah, that's one thing I've always been fascinated with. Have either of you seen Arrival? Have you loved Arrival? Yeah, I think Arrival is a really good movie. Yeah, um, I'd also be interested to watch uh, to watch the book, to read the book as well, or listen to it because uh, I just think, yeah, that narrative must have been so difficult to write and to like create that world. But yeah, because it's done really well in the film, um, and I often get put off uh, time twisty. Um, narratives because I I don't like the Christopher Nolan movies that do that <laughs> but um, yeah no I thought uh, yeah uh, the Arrival was really good at doing that and yeah well thank you both for all the books and adaptations you brought to the conversation I know I've added a few to my list um, to watch or listen to over the holidays and now I think it's time for our traditional game that we play. Um, And I've (laughs) allowed the theme to inform the game as well. So the questions will all be about adaptations. So for our game, I have three questions related to famous, they're all very famous, don't worry, famous movie adaptations of books. And like always, I'm going to assign you a noise to make in lieu of a buzzer. 
We're never going to invest in buzzers at Listening Books because it's too much fun to assign you <laughs> random noises to make. Um, so um, MGM Studios starts off with Leo the Lion doing a big roar. Everybody knows that, right? At the It's the classic um, yeah. start to all of those like old Hollywood films that we know so well. Mm-hmm. So, um, Leave, I'm going to ask you, uh, when you want to buzz in to answer a question, to roar, please. Can you give us an example of your finest roar? Roar! <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and Amy, I'm going to let you play director. And when you want to buzz in, you're going to call action. Can I hear you call action, please? Action. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. I've got three questions for you. Um, you can buzz in as soon as you think you know the answer. The first one is this 1995 adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma added phrases like, ugh, as if, to our vernacular. Action. Yes, Amy. Uh, I think it's clueless. It is clueless. Yay. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I th- I actually didn't hear the middle part of the question because you cut out, but I heard oh, that no. as if, and I was like, oh, it's clueless. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> Excellent. Never, never fear, leave. Here's another opportunity. Question two. The Wizard of Oz famously featured a pair of ruby red slippers, but what color were they in the book? Action. Amy? I don't know, uh, but I I don't know. Green feels like it rings a bell with me. I'm afraid not. Leave. have you got any guesses? No. <laughs> I'm going to guess gold? Um, no, but you were close or closer. The answer is silver. They were silver in the books. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well... Um, third question, and possibly the last, if Amy gets it right. This Stanley Kubrick adaptation, disliked by the novel's author Stephen King, features Jack Nicholson trying to write a book. Action. Roll! Oh, that was really close and possibly could have been affected by delay, but I heard Amy first. Uh, I think The Shining... It is The Shining. Leave. is that what you were going to say? <laughs> yes, it yeah. was. Um, that was so close. And I think there is a bit of a delay where... So even though I think Amy was the first to answer, I think Leave hears me later than Amy does. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So actually, let's do, a, um, let's do a tiebreaker. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I'm making this up on the fly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow I'm impressed by the uh, improv skills <laughs> mm. um, well only because I deleted all the other stuff that I had which was kind of a silly thing to do um, okay <laughs> this adaptation also stars uh, Jack Nicholson um, mm-hmm. but the book the book actually tells the story from uh, from the chief's point of view um, this adaptation also features one of the most infamous villains of all time, Nurse Ratchet. Um, and uh, it takes um, place in a in, in an asylum for the mentally ill. Action. Yes, Amy. Um, the one flew over the cookies cookies nest. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think um, I've seen the film. I haven't read the book of that. Yeah, um, Amy is our reigning champion. To be fair, you get a lot more practice than hey. most contestants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I do get to do it every time. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I also I famously don't have I don't have fast recall skills. Oh right, <laughs> I'm always the one in my friendship groups that are like when we quiz. I just was like, oh, I know it, but I know it, but it, and it's so, yeah. Oh, congratulations, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. How do you feel with your win? Uh, I feel like, uh, yeah, it, yeah, there was a reason for getting up this morning, um, and yeah, <laughs> mm. it's, um, it's made my day have a purpose. <laughs> Thanks to Liv and Amy for joining me. And thank you, as always, for listening. 
What are some adaptations of books that have struck a chord with you, I wonder? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Just look for Listening Books or follow the links in the show notes. If there's someone in your life who loves to read but finds it difficult to read or hold a printed book, they might just appreciate a gift membership to Listening Books. They'll have access to over 10,000 audiobooks, and it's really easy to set up. Because Listening Books is a charity, the person you're buying the membership for must live in the UK and have an illness, learning difficulty, disability, or mental health condition that affects their ability to read or hold a book. It's easy to do on our website, and I'll link to the gift membership page specifically in the show notes to make it even easier. The Listening Books podcast is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity that provides an audiobook lending service for over 115,000 members. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk. You have my best wishes as we end one year and begin again. Goodbye. See you next time. (laughs) Don't worry, I'll edit out the awkward pauses. (laughs) Yeah. Oh no, leave them in. (laughs) It adds adds a weird tension.